So in this video, our aim is to begin to develop our fundamental model that we're going to be using in economics, and that is our supply and our demand diagram. Now here, of course, all we're going to be taking a look at is the demand curve in particular. In the following video, we'll take a look at supply, and then in the third, we'll bring the two together to evaluate the market on whole, supply and demand. So this whole idea, this uh, model that we're building, the idea of it is to be able to explain how prices are determined. Right? Why is the price of an apple 69 cents per pound? Why are bananas the price that they go for? Why do houses cost what houses cost for? On and on and on. And so we're going to be taking a look at that, how prices are determined, how the quantity of bought and sold is determined, and then we'll overview kind of all the assumptions that need to be made in order for us to utilize this. Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at over the next three videos. Specifically in this video, though, we're focusing in on demand. Uh, our objectives. First, we're going to be taking a look at the alternative interpretations of our demand curve. We've already briefly looked at these, right? This is our marginal benefit uh, or marginal value and our maximum willingness to pay. So we'll explore these a little bit further and then we'll go and we'll uh, list our determinants of demand. The uh, different things that determine the shape of our demand curve, the location of our demand curve. And then of course, with that, as this changes, our demand curve will change as well. Uh, what we're going to do to finish off is we're going to be taking a look at different interpretations, or sorry, not different interpretations. We're going to be taking a look at different measurements of sensitivity, that is how sensitive is our quantity demanded to a change in the price. If price goes up by a dollar, well, how much does my quantity demanded change by? I will look, take a look at two kind of measures of this sensitivity, first being the marginal effect, and then we'll move on into elasticity. So all that being said, let's jump into taking a look at our demand curve and the features of it. So let's take a look at our demand. So the first thing to keep in mind is that when we're doing supply and demand analysis, one of the biggest things is that everything we are doing is being done cetris paribus. And okay, that's a very fancy word. It's like, ooh, we have Latin going on, makes us feel like a real science. Well, okay, Cetris Paribus, really what we're getting at with this is that we are analyzing a market, we're analyzing the demand for a good or service, all else constant. Everything else in the world, except for that one thing that we're analyzing the effect of, is constant. And that's always how we'll do all of our analysis. We'll hold everything in the world, everything in the universe fixed, except for that one thing that we're interested in. So this whole idea of Cetris Paribus very important construct, very important concept for us to utilize as we move forward through this supply and demand analysis. And it's a concept that we'll bring back many, many times. So Cetris Paribus, all else constant. This guy here, that's a good one to star. That's a good one to really write down and keep track of because it's a fundamental part of our analysis process. Okay. Farther, right? We've already gone through taking a look at demand, and now we're going on to taking a look at our market demand altogether, and then we'll get eventually get to the market on whole. Let's uh, let's just kind of go through our let's go through our assumptions again. So our assumptions when we eventually get to our supply and demand model. So we're not at supply yet, but when we get to our supply and demand model, that is when we're trying to model the market itself. We're going to have some fundamental assumptions. I want to bring these up now because I want to bring them up again when we get through supply and I want to bring them up again when we get into the market just so that we're clear as to what exactly is happening, what exactly we are analyzing. So the first kind of assumption that we have. First one is that we are going to have lots of homogenous consumers. So, okay, lots, yep, there's lots and lots of people who are consumers. This whole idea of homogenous, this just means that they're the same. So we have a whole bunch of consumers that are identical. This here really is just a way to make things easier, right? If we go back to kind of some of the examples we were looking at at consumer theory, where we said, hey, at a price of $5, maybe George had a quantity demanded of 10 and then we said, hey, George is one of 1,000 identical consumers. 
right? So, okay, if there's a thousand Georges out there and they're all identical in their preferences, that is, they're all consuming 10 units at $5, well, we can then work out from our individual personal demand from this good, we can work out our market demand for this good and say, hey, at $5, our quantity demand is, well, 10 from George and then another 10 from, well, the 999 others. So altogether, our quantity demanded would be 10,000 units. So really, that's just an easy kind of assumption for us to make in order to ease us in going from our personal demand curves up to our market demand curves. The other one, and this is kind of going to go back to more of our supply side, and really the same idea is that we're going to have lots of homogeneous producers, right? And this would be, again, going back to our producer, series, uh, producer theory side where we were creating our supply curve, right? And we could say, hey, at a price of $8, whoa. Let's try that again. At a price of $8, we had a quantity supplied from firm A of something like, let's say, 20. And then if we had a thousand identical producers, right? And this is actually going back to one of our assumptions that we made in producer theory, that we had perfect information. Everybody had access to the same cost, the same technology, on and on and on. That is, all of our producers were identical. Well, then in that case there, we could say, okay, this was for the individual, this was for the individual producer, individual consumer, for the market altogether then at a price of $8, $20, or sorry, 20 units being supplied per firm, 1,000 firms altogether, well, my quantity supplied would be 20,000, right? So again, just an easy assumption for us to utilize, but Turns out this is also going to be an important assumption, and we'll see why it becomes increasingly important as we take a look at cases where these are not true. And we'll take a look at that as the semester, as the videos go on. So basic assumptions for us as we work through this demand and then eventually the supply model. Okay, another big part that we have to kind of get clear. This big part here is the distinction the distinction between demand and the quantity demanded and let's let's take a look at this to really get this distinction it's an important one so we'd have our price we would have our quantity and then we would have our demand curve right so that there's our demand curve this entire line is our demand, right? And what the demand is, is it's giving us every read-off, every combination as we go through of price and quantity demanded. Price and quantity demanded. So what the demand is, is it's a schedule, it's a line showing the relationship between price and quantity demanded. Red line demand. In this case here, our quantity demanded is the actual quantity that we are wanting to purchase, wanting to buy for each price point. Keep in mind, right, as we get into this, I might be demanding, I might be wanting to buy so much bread. That won't necessarily always mean that I'll be able to. It's just how much I'm demanding, how much I'm wanting. And we'll take a look at that as this goes on. But for now, the distinction between our demand curve and the quantity demand. What we'll then take a look at is kind of this idea of our law of demand. So I really, I really hate the use of this language in economics. That is, right, if we go back to the sciences, the distinction between a law and a theory. Law is something that always holds. Theory is kind of our abstraction. It tends to explain the world around us pretty well, but we know it's not perfect. We know there's some problems in our definition. Well, I hate, really dislike in economics when we use this word law because very, very few things in economics are actually laws. They're primarily theories. They're primarily things that tend to explain the world around us pretty well. 
and then in other cases they don't. But just the same, this is commonly referred to as our law of demand, and what the law of demand says is that price and quantity demanded are inversely related. That is, if our price goes up, we want less stuff. If the price goes down, oh, price up, we want less stuff. If the price goes down, well, we'd want more stuff. Right, and we actually worked through this already. We worked through this with our income and substitution effect. We saw why this is the case. We saw how this happens. Our consumer aims to balance their marginal utility per dollar spent on each good, right? So marginal utility of X, marginal utility of Y, and marginal utility per dollar equated. And we worked through to see how this law of demand works through and why it's the case, giving us our downward sloping demand curve. Okay, so we have that. Big assumptions. We have the distinction between demand and quantity demand. A lot of this is just kind of rehashing things we've already looked at in consumer theory. What we're going to be taking a look at next is kind of our three definitions of demand. Again, just a farther rehash of what we've already looked at. This is going to be the demand interpretation, the maximum willingness to pay interpretation, and the marginal benefit or marginal value interpretation. And so let's take a look at that. Let's take a look. Let's take a look to start off with our demand interpretation. So the demand interpretation is saying, hey, we go and we witness out in the wild some price. So we witness some price of, let's say, $10 per shirt. So we witness t-shirts being sold for $10 each. Once we have that price, we then go and say, okay, yeah, given this price, I am going to want to buy so many t-shirts, right? So we're witnessing a price. We are then determining how many t-shirts we want to buy. Alternatively, we could have our marginal benefit interpretation which would be saying, well, a bit of a different kind of scenario in that case there. We could be saying in that case there, hey, let's suppose that, I don't know, let's suppose that I'm buying 10 t-shirts. At 10 t-shirts, uh, maybe this is, uh, maybe this isn't quite going to work. Yeah, let's say 10 t-shirts. I'm going to buy 10 t-shirts at that there. My marginal benefit, that is the extra benefit I get from the last t-shirt then purchased, is going to be equal to, let's say, uh, let's say $30. Actually, let's, uh, let's go back there. Let's make this equal. Let's say that, that there was $10 per shirt, right? So, okay, I consumed, I want to buy 10 t-shirts, and I'm going to continue to buy 10 t-shirts until that last one is 10 per shirt, right? We could then say, okay, if that's that way, this would be that way as well. Finally, we could take a look at it this way, our maximum willingness to pay. And in the maximum willingness to pay, it's kind of saying the same thing. Hey, if I were to buy 10 t-shirts, well, the marginal benefit that I received, right? We could change that marginal benefit or marginal value, which I've received from the last as I went from nine to 10 was monetarily equivalent to $10 per shirt. Well, if that's that value, if that's that benefit that I receive, the most I would pay for my 10th shirt would be $10 because that's the value. That's the benefit that I got, the extra value, the extra benefit that I got from that last t-shirt consumed. Hence, the most that I'd be willing to pay. Now, okay, you're probably looking at this and you're like, okay, Keith, the, all of these cases, you just have price, quantity, price, quantity. Why? What's the difference? Well, okay, keep in mind, demand, we witnessed a price, we wound up at a quantity. Okay? Marginal benefit. We had a quantity and we determined the marginal benefit. 
the extra value, the extra benefit, monetized benefit we got from that last unit. Maximum willingness to pay, same idea. We have a quantity and we go up to saying, what's the most that I would pay for this? So really the distinction between these three different interpretations is which direction we approach this from, where the distinction between these two guys, that distinction is okay, are we measuring the most that I'd be willing to pay? Or are we trying to think about this in terms of a value benefit kind of situation? Turns out both are going to be relevant. Both are going to be important to us. So let's take a look at a scenario. Let's suppose that we have price equals 30 minus 2 quantity demanded. So, okay, here comes the math, right? You're like, oh, oh, what is this? What exactly does this mean? Well, let's, let's just back up. And let's recall for ourselves that this here is actually just the formula for a line. A line is y equals mx plus b. Okay, what's, what's all these values? Well, y, that there is our possible values. Y is our possible values along here, right? This here is our endogenous variable. That is, we're saying right now, y is being explained by x, right? Something's happening. We're witnessing x out in the wild. X is getting transformed and explaining y. So y is our endogenous. That's being explained within this system. X is then our exogenous variable. It's being explained without, outside of our system. And so typical convention is y goes on the vertical axes and x goes on the horizontal. x explains y. Okay, what else do we have going on here? Well, we have m. m is our slope such that this guy here is the change in y over the change in x, right? You've also known that as your rise over your run. And okay. So slope, that's our value of m. And then b here, what's this guy? This you'll often hear being called your vertical intercept. That there, that's going to be the value of y when x is 0. So, hey, if x was 0, all we have, well, 0 times the slope, this guy is just 0, so y equals b. Whatever this value is, that would be where we find ourselves on this vertical axes and we'd find it that way there so okay we have y we have x let's go and take a look at how this guy then falls in and then first thing you look at is go oh my goodness where's the y where's the x where's the m where's the b well okay let's just let's just fix things up a little bit instead of y well, instead of y we're looking at price instead of x we are looking at quantity demand, right? And then if we go back to this and say, okay, the way that we have this equation written is price being explained by quantity demanded. We witness some quantity and then we determine the price. Well, if you think about that, the way we have this written, which out of these three, and it could be more than one, which out of these three interpretations is being displayed in the way that this function is written? In this case here, this would be either the marginal benefit or the maximum willingness to pay. We observe a quantity, we get some dollar value. We observe a quantity, we get some dollar value, right? 10 gets transformed, gives us a price. This guy here, this guy would be a little bit different. If we had that guy, it would be... Uh, quantity demanded is going to be 15 minus one half price. That's what we have in that case. And in that case there, what we're saying is, okay, we witnessed some price. And then from this price witnessed, we end up with some quantity demanded. In intro to economics, what we will predominantly be dealing with is this formation of writing our supply and our demand curves. And the reason why 
is because most of us are used to this whole y equals mx plus b, right? And so being used to y equals mx plus b, y being vertical, x being horizontal, this formation actually makes sense. This guy, this is our demand curve, but you'll notice that it's backwards, right? This guy here, our endogenous variable, is on the horizontal. This guy here, our exogenous variable, is on the vertical, right? That is, our axes are reversed from what we would want, to, how we would want to think of these. So, useful, if you're comfortable, you can play around with our actual demand formula, but for the most part, we're gonna be working with this inverse demand or with this marginal benefit, maximum willingness to pay formula. So, okay, that's kind of the first thing to get in mind with this. Second thing, Okay, what's our slope? What's our vertical intercept? Here we have y equals mx plus b. What's my m? What's my, well, okay. What we have here, you can think of p, that's y. Let's, uh, let's just change colors there. The way that I actually have this written right now is y equals b minus mx. Right, and you're like, oh, but it was mx plus b. Yep, yep, we can write it this other way. Perfectly fine. Right, it's just another way of writing that. Right, if you want to think about it, there is no difference between going five plus negative two versus negative two plus five. Right, you're going to get the same result in both ways. So, in this sense here, all we've done is we've just written it out a different way, primarily because I don't like negatives in the front. Um, just through my experience with math, when I have a negative sitting around in front, I tend to drop, I tend to forget that negative. So I'll typically write it in the case of demand where we have a negative slope, negative two, right? That's my M. When I have a negative slope, I'll typically write it intercept minus slope times quantity. Okay, so what's our actual demand curve here? Our actual demand curve, we could draw it in. Right, and to start off, boom, there we go, I'm just drawing a line. Let's update our values here. Well, what's the value, what's my price, what's my maximum willingness to pay, or my marginal benefit, right? It doesn't really seem to make sense given our interpretation, but mathematically, what's the value of P when my quantity is zero? Well, put in zero for quantity demanded, price equals 30. So, okay, I have that one, I have that vertical intercept. On the other extreme then, what is the value, how much would I want to buy if the price was zero? So, okay, to do that, we could solve this. We could now put in zero for price. We would have what? Zero equals 30 minus two quantity demanded. We could go through all our algebraic voodoo. So add two QD to both sides. Now I want to isolate get QD by itself, so divide both sides by 2, and I would get quantity demanded equals to 15. So there we go. I have my two extremes. I have the price when the quantity is 0, and I have the quantity demanded when the price was 0. From here, I can now work through a few different interpretations of this demand curve, right? So again, demand marginal benefit, or a maximum willingness to pay. I could go one way, as we already have, and say, and we'd say, hey, what would be the most that I'd be willing to pay for 10 t-shirts? Well, okay, 10 t-shirts, what's the most, the highest price I'd be willing to pay there? Let's try to keep that straight line up to there. Cutting across. Okay, I want to know what's the value of P when quantity demanded is 10? Well, go back up to my equation there. Let's just rewrite it. Price is 30 minus 2 quantity demanded. Well, I'm dealing with a quantity demanded of 10. So what do I have? Price is 30 minus 2 times 10, 30 minus 20. What's 30 minus 20? Price is going to be. 10. So, okay, there we go. 
we would have, based off of that, when I'm buying 10 t-shirts, the most that I'd be willing to pay for that 10th t-shirt is $10. Right? Very similarly, I can say, hey, what is, uh, what is the marginal benefit from our fifth shirt? Right? What's the extra benefit we received as we went from four to five shirts? When we buy that fifth shirt, how much extra value, extra benefit did I receive? Well, okay, let's use green to solve this guy. Let's see. Okay, if that's 15, that's 10. Maybe something like that is five. So, okay, marginal benefit. Let's go up and take a look. Marginal benefit, again, is going quantity to price, quantity to the monetized benefit, the, mar the monetized value, marginal benefit, marginal value. So, starting off at this point here, I could go five, boom, going up, cutting across, and I would get my value of my marginal value, my marginal benefit. Right, the extra monetized size that I would receive from that fifth t-shirt. So again, in that case there, our formula price is 30 minus 2 quantity demanded. In this case, my quantity demanded was 5. So 30 minus 2 times 5. What's 2 times 5? 10. So price is 30 minus 10. That there would be a price of... That is, at five t-shirts, the extra benefit, the extra value I received from that last t-shirt consumed would be $20 for that last shirt. So I could work out marginal benefit just in the same way, really, as I worked out my maximum willingness to pay. So, okay, put in 20 there. On the other side, Okay, we've taken a look at maximum willingness to pay. We've taken a look at marginal benefit. What if I had a scenario where it was how many shirts would be demanded at a, um, let's say, at a Price of, let's say a price of 12. Okay, so when price equals 12, how many shirts are we going to demand? Well, okay, again, our formula, price equals 30 minus 2, quantity demanded. So, what is that going to be? That is going to be, let's pull our formula down. Price is 30 minus 2, quantity demanded. So in this case, we don't know what our quantity demanded is, right? What we That's what we're trying to find out. This is our unknown. But what we do know is that we have a price of 12. So as we go to write this down, we have 12 equals 30 minus 2, quantity demanded. So, okay, we have our one unknown that we're trying to solve for. We need to go through our algebra to isolate quantity demanded and work out what it's equal to. So, okay, going through our algebraic voodoo, lots of ways that we can approach this question, lots of ways that we can solve through it. Myself, I hate these negatives. I try to get rid of these negatives first because if I don't, I accidentally drop them at some point working through it and I get the wrong answer. Looking at many students' work over the years, it seems like I'm not the only one that has this problem. And so typically, especially here in intro, one of the best ways to approach these is to get rid of your negatives. So first thing I want to do is I want to add 2QD to both sides. So I'm going to get 12 plus 2 quantity demanded equals 30. Okay, from here... Now everything's in positive, now I can begin working through. And so what I want to do is I want to get quantity demanded by itself, so let's subtract 12 from both sides. So 30 minus 12, that's going to give me quantity, sorry, 2 quantity demanded equals 18. 
and then get quantity demanded by itself. How do we do that? Well, we divide both sides by 2. So quantity demanded equals 9. So that is what I've worked out here. As I've said, hey, when we have a price of $12 per shirt, my quantity demanded is 9 shirts. Now, a good way to kind of double check that this makes sense is to go back up to our diagram and visually see if that works. So, okay, we have 10. So let's say that 12 is right about there. Uh, let's try to make that a straight line. There we go. Oh my goodness, I'm just doing the same thing over and over. Oh well, I tried. And if we drag that down, Okay, what do we have? We have, there's 10, this guy here is 12. What did we expect for our quantity demanded? We expected a quantity demanded of nine. Well, hey, there's 10. A little bit smaller on the number line is nine. Yes, my number line makes sense. Yes, this works out the way that I would have expected it to. So in that case there, no big surprises. Five is less than nine, which is less than 10, which is less than 15. My numbers line up the way they should. If I went through and put, hey, 12, but I calculated something like 19 for that, that should be a pretty big red flag, right? 19 is not less than 10. 19 is not less than 15, right? 15 is this guy right here. We should never have a value bigger than 15 for any positive price. So in that case there, if you've calculated 19 for some reason, big red flag. Could not possibly be an answer. So going back to this diagram, taking a look at where our numbers fall with relation to other numbers is a good kind of check as to whether or not you've been doing your algebra correctly. So, okay, a few examples that we've worked through here, different interpretations of our demand. We've taken a look at that price, marginal benefit, willingness to pay, what we're going to take a look at now is kind of our determinants of demand. So, okay, let's go. Let's go and take a look. We'll carry forward this guy here. 30 minus 2 quantity demanded. And we're going to be taking a look at our determinants of demand. And altogether, there's six of them. And these are kind of six things that you want to have. Well, more or less memorized. You're going to want to have them pretty easily accessible so you don't have to do too much thinking or digging to work out what they are. And you can get, okay, some change in this. Well, that worked out to be then this situation. Uh, let's make that red. What did we have there? We had initially 30 and then slope of negative 2 giving us 15 down there. And this was my demand. So our determinants, six determinants. First one, right? And the reason I wanted this formula is so that we can kind of evaluate what's happening. And second thing, okay, keep in mind we're talking about determinants of demand, not our determinants of our willingness to pay, not our determinants of our marginal benefit. Now, yes, keep in mind, maximum willingness to pay, marginal benefit was just the inverse of the demand. That is, our demand would actually be, what did we say? Quantity demanded was 15 minus one half price, right? That was technically what our demand function was. This guy up here, this would have been our marginal benefit, our maximum willingness to pay, or it would be called our inverse demand. So in this case here, we're going to be talking about demand. And right again, don't get too caught up with the math of this being inverted and being quantity to price. We're just going to demonstrate a few things as to, hey, how does our quantity demanded change? Cetris paribus, right? Everything else in the world held constant. So first thing that's going to determine this demand curve is going to be change in own price and that should be that should be pretty clear right we have price right there as we get new some new updated price well there's my new price there's my new quantity if my price falls well price fell 
by quantity demanded increases. So change in own price, all that this does here is it just changes my quantity demanded. That's all. Okay. Let's get rid of that. Let's go take a look at our other determinants. Each of them will make this line either move along it or move the line itself. So the first guy there, change in own price, all that did was give us a new read off, a movement along the demand curve. Second one. Well, second thing we're going to be looking at is going to be the change in the price of another good. Right, and in this case here, change in the price of another good, there's gonna be two possible situations that's gonna happen. We could have another good, which is either a substitute, or we could have another good, which is a complement. And let's talk about what these two goods are in this case here. So a substitute, this is something that we buy instead of. Right, so let's see. A substitute, we could be taking, uh, we could be talking about, let's say, coffee and tea, right? Maybe you have a slight preference towards coffee, maybe you have a slight preference towards tea, but the fact is, is that typically if you're going for a hot drink, you're going for coffee or tea. You're typically not consuming both in conjunction, right? And so in that case there, Let's suppose that right now we are analyzing, we are looking at the market for coffee. So, okay, this is the market for coffee. I have my price of coffee. I have my quantity of coffee demanded. And let's suppose that all of a sudden the price of tea drops. Well, okay, if the price of tea drops, we have to kind of go back and think about our whole consumer theory bit. Right? We don't have to go model the whole thing, but just to think about it, do I want more tea or less tea? Well, Cetris Paribus, everything else in the world constant, the only thing changing is the price of tea, and then we're analyzing the effect of that. Price of tea is the only thing changing. As the price of tea falls, I'm going to be enticed to have more tea. Right, and again, this is going to be partly a substitution effect. This is going to be partly an income effect. You can work through marginal utility coffee, price coffee, marginal utility tea, price tea, right? Oh, price of tea fell. This whole guy got bigger. So, boom, that guy's bigger. We re-equate, right? That was our whole consumer theory chapter going through why this happens. Okay, so we said quantity demanded of tea goes up. Well, hey, scarce, not scarce, but limited income, scarce resources. If we're consuming more tea, then, okay, if we're having more tea, that's going to mean that we're going to have less coffee, right? So, okay, we could go through and we could say that my quantity demand for coffee, therefore, must have fallen. Right? And again, if you're lost on that, work through this as we did in consumer theory and work through the impacts that that's going to have on our quantity demanded of the other good. So, okay, let's presume, right, and this is the big thing to kind of keep in mind here. Okay, we've said price of T down, quantity demanded of T up. Okay, we have said nothing about the price of coffee, right? We've kind of had this price of coffee being fixed. Keep in mind, Cetris Paribus, the only thing being influenced is this price of T. So we have a constant price of coffee. Let's just throw in a arbitrary price line. Let's just say, boom, something like that, arbitrary price line being, hey, at this current price, I was having that quantity demanded. My initial starting point before price of T changed. Then, okay, price of T changed, quantity demanded T up, no change in the price of coffee, but I have to substitute, I have my income. So if I'm consuming more tea, that means I'm consuming less coffee. So, okay, what does that mean? Less coffee. I now find myself having less coffee. Potential problem, though. Same price, less quantity. I'm now over in this zone. 
which is off my demand curve, right? This is like, whoa, why, why are we doing over here? Well, okay, the reason why we're off this demand curve is because technically this change in the price of T causing this movement along my demand for T, right? Change in price, price of own good, change in quantity demanded. So all I've done is move along my demand curve for T, but it has caused my demand for coffee to shift. And in this case here, I now have this new point right there. So that is my demand for coffee would have fallen. My demand for coffee is shifting to the left. And this might be some new value such as 28 and 14. Just to give an example as to what the updated numbers might look like. So, okay. In that case there, substitution effect or substitute, change in the price of a substitute. Price of our substitute fell, so we want more of the substitute, less of this good, so our demand for this good falls, goes down. Going back to our kind of equation here, well, where does this show up? Right, our first case, change in own price caused a change in quantity demanded. Well, where is this happening? We're not having a change in price, but we are having a change in quantity demanded. Used to be right here. We're now right there. How is this coming in in the function? Well, in this case, this change in price of another good, this is influencing this intercept. Right? You can think about this value here as everything else that affects the quantity demanded that isn't the price of own good. So as we go through all of our other determinants of demand, what all of these other determinants of demand are influencing is this intercept, right? Or equivalently, this intercept. Every time we have any change in two through six, that change is gonna be influencing the intercept. It's gonna cause the line to shift, either to shift left or to shift right. And for our case in Econ 103, we're always going to presume it's a parallel shift, right? That isn't going to be, there's no change in the slope. Truthfully, some of these would affect slope as well, but we're going to wave our hands. We're going to keep things simple, and we're just going to have par parallel shifts of the curve. So just to make things easier for us. Okay, that was our substitution effect. Let's, uh, let's go back. Let's rewind. And let's take a look at this other side, this whole complement. So complements are going to be goods you eat together. So eat. Um, complements you consume together. If we're talking about eating, sure, we can be talking about that. Right? In that case there, maybe this is going to be hot dogs. And I'm just going to abbreviate HD for hot dog buns. Right? Typically, you buy hot dog buns to eat the hot dogs in, and if you're buying hot dogs, well, you need hot dog buns as well. That is, typically, you don't consume one of these goods on their own. You typically consume them together. They're complements. They go together. So what does that do? Well, let's just erase this guy here. Let's make some room, and let's take a look at how we would model that. Okay, so let's presume we're looking at our market for hot dogs as displayed. So, okay, first of all, what do we have? We have our demand for hot dogs being downward sloping. Right now, I just have some current price of hot dogs, and at that price, what the current quantity demanded is. So, okay, just reading that off of our curve. In this case, let's suppose that my price of hot dog buns goes up. So, okay. Hot dog buns are now more expensive. Well, law of demand, price up, quantity demanded down. Or you can think about it through our consumer theory. How, okay, two goods, how does that work through? So price of hot dog buns goes up. Well, then my quantity demanded for hot dog buns is going to go down. So, okay, this is all in the market for hot dog buns. Keep in mind, I'm looking at the market for hot dogs, my demand for hot dogs. This is my this is my shock. This is what has happened. This is what I'm trying to analyze how a change in the price of hot dog buns has influenced my market for hot dogs. And keeping in mind, nothing's happened to the price of hot dogs. 
So I still have price of hot dogs being fixed, but if I'm buying less hot dog buns, well, because price of hot dog buns are more expensive and I buy hot dogs and hot dog buns together, well, if I'm buying fewer hot dog buns, I will also be buying fewer hot dogs. Right? I'm not just going to buy extra hot dogs and just consume them without the bun, right? Not some sort of savage in this kind of case. The hot dogs go in the bun. So as I consume fewer hot dog buns, I will also consume fewer hot dogs. And so in this case here, we have a falling, right, once again, quantity one, my quantity demand falls, but my price is unchanged. So once again, I find myself at a new point that is off my demand curve. And so a new point off my demand curve, what does that mean? It means that, oh, let's do an actual straight line. It means that once again, my demand curve has shifted to the left. My demand for hot dogs has fallen. So, okay, we've taken a look at how changes in prices of other goods affects the demand for our good. And we took a look at this for both a substitute and a complement. Of course, in each case, I only looked at it in one direction. I presume, right, given the symmetry of the problem, you can work through it in the other direction just fine. Well, let's carry on. Let's take a look at our other determinants of demand. Okay, so our third determinant of demand, our third determinant of demand is going to be change in income. And change in income, we'll take a look at how this goes through. But what we're going to have for income, just like we introduced already with our consumer theory, well, we're going to have normal goods. And we're also going to have inferior goods. Right? And again, to refresh our memory, normal goods are those that behave normally. And inferior goods are those that, well, as we have more income, we stop buying them. And so let's take a look at a case for a normal good, because normal good, that's what we're going to be typically dealing with. So we'll have our price, we'll have our quantity, and we'll have our demand curve downward sloping. There we go. Demand, we can give it some context. Maybe this is the demand for cookies. And cookies are definitely a normal good. In this case, let's presume that all of a sudden I get a raise at work, right? So I get a raise at work, so my income has gone up. Boom, spike in my income. Well, okay, keep in mind, we're analyzing the effect of this change in income on my demand for cookies, cetris paribus, everything else held constant. That includes, right, everything else held constant means all of these other determinants being held constant, so, no change in the price of other goods, no change in the price of my own good. So, hey, no change in the price of my own good. That means that I have just some reference price line here. We'll call that P0, such that that was the original price of cookies. That there was the original quantity demanded of cookies. And all that's changed, no change in price, no change in price, just a change in income. Okay, normal good, all of a sudden I have more money. What do I want? Do I want more cookies or fewer cookies all else constant? Well, being a normal good, I have more money. That means I can afford more cookies. Let's use an actual line for that. I can afford more cookies and my demand curve would shift out. It would increase to the right. Right, and again, how, how would we work that out? I kind of jumped a few steps there. Let's actually think about that. What's happening? Okay, my income goes up. For a higher income, I can buy more cookies, all else constant. Okay, I can buy more cookies, all else constant. Boom, I find myself out here. Quantity demanded one. My quantity demanded increased for a fixed price, right? Everything else is constant. I find myself at this point here. If I'm at that point, I'm off my current demand curve, which means the reason why I'm off it is because my actual demand curve has shifted, has increased, 
and I now have a new demand curve that is out to the right of the old one. So my income effect happening. There. If cookies were an, an inferior good, that is, hey, I have more money, I'm going to stop buying cookies, I'm going to shift my, uh, my consumption to things that are maybe more luxurious. Well, in that case, they would have the opposite effect, right? As I as my income went up, if cookies were inferior, I'd want fewer cookies. So my quantity demanded for cookies would fall. As my quantity demanded falls for a fixed price, my demand curve would have fallen. So normal versus inferior good, depending on what's happening, income up could either cause the quantity to rise as well or the quantity to fall, depending on what type of good it is. Keep in mind, most goods are normal, hence why we refer to them as normal goods. Okay, let's carry on. Let's take a look at a few of our other determinants of demand. So next determinant of demand here, number four, this is going to be changes in tastes. So changes in tastes, let's take a look at, uh, we'll go price, we'll go quantity, we'll throw our demand curve in here. And let's say that this here is our demand for beef. And so tastes, these are things that um, often you will see this actually presented as tastes or preferences. And so in this case here, okay, change in taste. Let's say that all of a sudden we have a new news item and the news item is saying, hey, all of a sudden we have a huge case of mad cow disease. Right, and mad cow disease, big problem with mad cow disease is that if you eat infected beef, well, you could get infected with this disease and then you will have the lifelong consequences of this. So, okay, boom, huge outbreak of mad cow disease. It might be any bit of ground beef, any bit of beef that's out there might be infected with this. Okay, given this news item, what has happened to your taste for beef? What has happened to your preference for beef? Right, if we take a look at this, Again, this has happened, Cetris Paribus, everything else in the world is constant except for that. That is no change in the own price, no change in the price of another good, no changes in income. The only thing in the world that's happened is this change in information. We now have this information about mad cow disease. So price not, I used to consume, quantity demanded not, now with this new information, how have my taste changed? Am I going to say, hey, I want to consume a ton more beef, all else equal? Well, probably not, right? Given this mad cow disease, given that any beef consumed might be tainted with this and you would suffer the lifelong effects, you're probably not going to want to increase your quantity demanded beef. In fact, what would happen is your quantity demanded beef would fall, right? It might fall all the, all the way to zero, but we'll presume it just falls, not all the way. Some people might still want to consume some. And so given this falling demand, well, we have our quantity demanded one. Again, not on our curve. How do we get there? Well, that's because our demand for beef, again, let's use an actual line. Our demand for beef has fallen, shifted to the left. So how different changes in tastes and preferences, these news items, this new information that becomes all of a sudden aware to us can influence our demand for a good. But you could have the opposite case. You could find that all of a sudden, hey, it turns out new research has suggested that beef is some new like superfood. It cures cancer, diabetes, all sorts of chronic illnesses. By eating beef, boom, you're cured. Some way, somehow, I don't know, right? Well, in that case there, wow, beef seems amazing. Well, all else equal, all of a sudden this new information changes your tastes or your preferences for beef, and you would jump to a higher level of consumption for the same price, and your demand would increase. So 
just changes in tastes and preferences, what can either cause increases or decreases in our demand for a good. Okay, so our next determinant to take a look at is going to be expectations. So what's happening with expectations, one of the big things in economics is that we will take future expectations, right? And this is we as in rational economic agents. We will take future expectations and we can often force them or cause them to happen today. So for example, this is just essentially expectations of my future. And this can be expectations of any of these other situations. So for example, if I expect all of a sudden my income to be higher, hey, I'm gonna get a raise next week, even though my income hasn't changed yet, so it's not a change in income, but because I'm expecting a change in income, I might go and increase my demand for vehicles. I might go buy a new car. I might begin to buy more cookies, right? Because I'm expecting this change in my income. Very similarly, right, if I'm expecting all of a sudden the price of ice cream to fall. Well, okay, I'm expecting the price of ice cream to go down. Well, hey, do I want to pay $5 for ice cream today? Or if I expect it to be $4 tomorrow, how about I just wait till tomorrow? So that is, if I'm going to expect the price to fall, well, I'm just going to change my demand for ice cream today. So in this case here, these expectations of the future can influence the demand for a good today. And by working through that, we just kind of have to rationalize what would happen. Like, hey, if the price of ice cream were to fall, I'd want to buy more ice cream. But hey, okay, I want to buy more ice cream. But today, that means that I'm not going to buy any ice cream because I can wait till tomorrow. As long as you have the patience, right? Some people might be like, no, 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 sorry, ice cream is daily. I, I need my ice cream today. If it's cheaper tomorrow, great, but I'm still buying it today, right? And that's okay. People are different, but that's our basic ex idea is that your expectation, you're going to change your behavior today based off of what you think will happen. Okay, so that's our expectations. Final one, six, population, right? That is how many consumers we have in a given market. And the reason why this works out to be part of our determinants of demand goes back to how we derived our market demand curve, right? So keep in mind the way that we derived this, if you want to think about it in a picture sense, we had personal demand curves and then we had our market demand curve, right? So we had, okay, this guy's personal demand curve, this guy's personal demand curve, and then we had all together our market demand curve such that when we went through this right we said ah, let's just carry this all the way through at a price of three dollars person a might demand two person b might demand two meaning in the market altogether we would have four right two from person a two from person b four all together if we all of a sudden had two of these guys and two of these guys, well, that would be two and two. This would be two and two. So four and four. We would have now a market demand of eight. That is, right, let's maybe do that the other way. Let's go and say all of a sudden, because we have twice as many people A, twice as many people B, my demand curve has now gone out like that, which has, I guess I'm changing colors with my demand curves. Boom, to boom. Now giving me eight as my total quantity demanded in the market. So if I have more people which I'm aggregating their personal demand, well, more aggregation of personal demand is going to mean a market demand that's pushed farther out less aggregation of personal demand. If I have fewer people in here, well, that's gonna cause my demand curve to shift to the left because I'm not gonna be pushing it as far out. So the impact of population or how many people, how many consumers we have in a market and how it affects our demand curve. Okay, 
So that's our demand curve. That's how our demand curve moves or jumps or dances. We'll take a look at a few examples of this, and then we're going to go on and take a look at price sensitivity and different measurements of that. So let's take a look at an example next. Okay, let's take a look at some examples of the impact of changes in our different determinants of demand on the demand. So first one, let's presume we're modeling a normal good. Let's, uh, let's say that we are taking a look at the market for uh, the market for pizza, which we will presume is normal. And for pizza, we have our starting condition here. So we have our price, we have our quantity, and we have our demand for pizza. Demand. Okay. Now what's going to happen here? In this case, we're going to presume that suddenly the economy faces a severe recession causing our incomes to drop. So, okay, severe recession causing our incomes to drop. What is that going to do to our demand curve? Well, severe recession causing our incomes to drop. So severe recession, citrus paribus, all else constant. That is, right, we can presume for a fixed... Uh, we can presume for a fixed price level, we are analyzing this for. So, okay, we used to be right there. Severe recession happens, incomes drop. If incomes drop, I just cannot afford as much pizza as I used to. So my quantity demanded for pizza is going to drop as well. Bringing me down to there. Keep in mind this new point here, this is not on my current demand curve. So what has happened to my demand for pizza? My demand for pizza has shifted to the left. My demand for pizza has fallen. So severe recession causing incomes to drop, demand curve shifts to the left. Okay, this time here, let's take a look at the market for, we're looking at the demand of cars. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, with respect to the demand for cars, we witness that the price of trucks, uh, the price of trucks increases. So, okay, price of trucks has gone up. Great, cool, interesting. We are analyzing the market for cars, the demand for cars. We want to know what's going to happen over here. So, okay. Really, this is going to be a change in the price of another good. And we need to determine, okay, is this a complement or a substitute? Well, okay, you've got to think about this. Do you typically go and buy a car and a truck at the same time? Right? Well, you have to have a truck for every car that I own. No, typically, to a degree, trucks and cars are substitutes to each other. Right? You typically need a vehicle. That vehicle may be a car. It may be a truck. So if we work through this... Uh, price of trucks goes up. That means our quantity demanded for trucks goes down. What's happening over in the car market? Well, keep in mind, this is all Statris Paribus. This is our shock. We're trying to analyze what happens to it. Everything else in the world is constant, so fixed price. My, price of, my quantity of cars it used to be there. Trucks has gone up. I'm buying... Fewer trucks, if I'm buying fewer trucks, that means that I'm substituting towards cars. So I'm going to buy more cars. In that case there, my quantity demanded of cars has gone up. So, putting me somewhere like that. Not on my demand curve. If it's not on my demand curve, that means that my demand curve has shifted out to the left. Let's see if I can get that to actually pass through my line. There we go. My demand curve has shifted out to the left, meaning that my demand, sorry, has shifted out to the right, meaning my demand for cars has increased. So two examples to look at there, and we can take a look at how exactly that's worked out. Let's take a look at one more. Okay, let's suppose that we're evaluating, in this case here, the demand for real estate. And in this case, let's presume that we expect, we expect the price of real estate, and I'm going to go like this. I expect the price of real estate 
to fall. That is, we're not saying that the price of real estate has gone down, right? We are right at our current price. And at our current price, we have our current quantity demanded. All we're saying is that I have this expectation for real estate to fall. And again, Cetris Paribus, so no change in price. So, okay, this is P naught. This is my initial quantity, Q naught. And the other thing to keep in mind is that you're not the only one. We have lots of homogenous consumers. So that is, you're all the same. You all have this same expectation. Everybody is expecting the price of real estate to fall. So, okay, if everybody's expecting the price of real estate to fall, do you want to buy a house today? Do you want to buy a house today or do you want to buy a house next month, right? When the price has fallen, which one do you want to do? Well, hopefully you realize that, okay, if you're expecting the price of real estate to fall, you're going to wait for your purchase. You're not going to buy real estate today. You're going to wait till next month when the price falls. So if you're expecting the price of real estate to fall, your quantity demanded for real estate today has shrunk. As your quantity demanded has shrunk, Still at the same price point, we are at that point there, giving us our new updated demand curve of D prime. So demand curve would have shifted to the left, demand would have fallen, and we would have less demand altogether, giving us our new read off of price and our new quantity demanded. So a few examples to work through as to how these demand curves can move around. Hopefully that helps you kind of get things straight. This is a fundamental part of what we're going to need to be able to do for our supply and demand market analysis is be able to work through changes in different determinants, different aspects in the world around us in order to influence, okay, in order to determine has my demand curve moved, has my supply curve moved. And then ultimately, once we work that through, we can work out the final influence on price and quantities. So this determinants of demand, pretty big part as we move forward.